when I grew up, I was uh, fascinated by snow and um, like um, when you uh, uh, take a ball into snow and you roll a ball, then if you start rolling it in only one direction, the ball becomes a wheel, but in the, in the middle you will find the ball, but it, it will grow really fast, uh, uh, high, because it only rolls in one direction and it will become very good in rolling in one direction. But then when it, this com it, you use an analogy with your life uh, and you roll always in one direction and you um, have changed or you took the wrong values, which you mostly do when you are young, um, then that wheel will fall and then you will need years to find that ball again to roll in all directions. And what I try to do is, I, I always was curious and that ball always rolled in all directions. And if you do that, you don't grow that fast, but you grow stable and you, you have a ball that can't fall. So whatever happens with you, you are still able to roll. Um, and, and, and that's some life philosophy that I uh, created for me 20 years or 25 years ago, because I'm a, a huge addict on snow and mountain sports. I lived in Switzerland for a while, but I think that is something that people forget because they all want to go and be a wheel and be fast and go and hyper-focused, but then you're gonna fall. <laughs> and the, the higher that wheel is, the bigger your fall will be if you have never fallen before. <laughs> Bart DeWitt is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Bart is one of Europe's leading and awarded experts on the digital transformation of healthcare and one of the most progressive forward thinkers focusing on finding alternative European strategies for the current postmodern world to create a more desirable future with greater social benefits. He is the initiator of the Hippo AI Foundation in Berlin, which aims to make artificial intelligence and medicine a common good. With his mission to use technology for the greater good, Bar has been on this mission to harness the power of artificial intelligence to help to solve current and future inequalities in healthcare. He wrote his first paper on artificial intelligence in 1989 while he was on, in grammar school and restarted his interest in 2010 while working for IBM. He is involved as a mentor for dozens of digital health startups and lectures at various universities throughout Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, and China. He co-founded the Digital Health Academy where he shares his knowledge to improve digital literacy. Uh, in the show notes, we're gonna put all his links and websites. I want my listeners to know how I know Bart. Uh, we know each other through uh, mutual friend, Harold Neidhart, and our paths have crossed at numerous um, conferences and on and offline before, but we're both members of the faculty of uh, Future IO. We're both featured in the book, Moonshots for Europe, and. Bart has a wonderful section in the book, the, the Case for Open Source Medical AI, a Foundation for Global Universal Digital Health. And uh, as a good friend and uh, also a brand new papa, congratulations, he just had yeah. a wonderful baby. And, and, and uh, so during the pandemic, so that's absolutely fabulous. Welcome Bart to the show. Thank you, Mark, for having me. And I hope nobody minds sometimes the screaming baby in the background. We are in a lockdown, so uh, I don't want to lock him down. <laughs> Absolutely not. We don't mind at all. That's real life. Uh, we've had dogs in the background and kids in the background and all sorts of other things. So it's just beautiful to know that life's going on regardless of the, the craziness surrounding us. Um, this year really started out as a bang, Bart. I mean, we we're in the decade of action. A lot of positive things were moving forward as far as sustainability, moving into the true digital transformation and, and new things just on the horizon. Then bam, we were hit with tons of craziness besides the uh, US election that set our world out on, on a different course or, or has kind of put us in turmoil. 
I, for one thing, have been busier than ever during this time because of what I've talked about in the past. And from what I've seen from afar, you also, in the, in, in the beginning of this, were on numerous panels talking about COVID, talking about AI and health and things, because it's really applicable to what you've been doing. And so my first question is, one, how have you weathered the pandemic? Has any of this in the past helped you to prepare a little bit better or to be aware uh, how to deal with something like this because you're kind of this futurist thinking about the future of health? Um, and, and just besides the beautiful baby, how, how have you guys been? How have you weathered this? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, on, on regards to your first question, yeah, although everybody knew that we were going to have a pandemic, there were papers published in 2008 uh, that were pr predicting this. Um, we all were surprised, perhaps, in my industry that our governments were not that prepared. So my initial focus was to see how can we, uh, at, that, at that moment, it was still a big unknown because we saw these images from Bergamo. People had fears and uh, we were talking about the lack of supplies medical supplies, human supplies in terms of do we have staff, nurses, bed, ICU beds. So of course I, I stopped all my activities and, and saw I could help. And uh, I started and I tried initial, uh, a few projects, some of them failed, but others were really um, uh, things that I co-initiated really became global movements. And it all focused on the things that I already was working on. Uh, open source that accelerates innovation, using digital collaboration tools, using digital manufacturing. Um, so it was for me a very uh, learningful period uh, because suddenly the things that I talked to could be applied. And uh, to give you one example, uh, a friend of mine in Berkeley started um, a, a group to, the original idea was to open source a ventilator. Um, and at the beginning, everybody was kind of laughing. Then we changed it into open sourcing medical supplies and we didn't, eight weeks, uh, we formed a community of 80,000 people that produced over 25 million goods uh, produced in over 42 countries, all on open source. Eight weeks, I've never seen something like it. It was uh, pretty amazing and it showed the power of open collaboration without boundaries. And although our governments were benchmarking each other, which I have the less debts and my policies are better, uh, people haven't been more open to collaborate and there was more unity between people than unity on uh, a governmental level because uh, they were com mixing it up with ideologies which I personally uh, uh, disagreed on because um, um, you can't compare and benchmark countries based on very different metrics. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing that. I, I... I do, uh, you know, we, we do without throughout our discussion today, we definitely want to focus in on how your thoughts and ideas are uh, of what you've progressed up until this point, but mainly about open source transparency, you know, using things, get bringing it down to the, the bottom up, giving it, making it open for everybody and available so that we can start solving some of these gro global grand challenges. Um, that That is something that's not only a self selfish, but also a different way of looking and thinking at things, but it's also this global view uh, of the world and how things work. And as we pull others out of poverty or give them the same basic resources we may have here in the developed world, that it changes the way our world functions and the way we have this long-term effect. So uh, the question I guess is, do you feel like a global citizen and how would you feel without nations, borders and divisions of humanity where we're not only, you know, not this, this opposite of open source that we're kind of closing off and dividing ourselves from each other and saying my, my view, my system, my government's better than yours. Well, that, that, that there's a lot of uh, questions within that question. Yeah. Um, um, but um. Um, and I think we need to, um, um, we know when we can talk later on that, that we have different views on universal basic income. We had a few conversations in the past because I believe that um, we need to work on uh, creating digital uh, commons. Uh, that means that we need to create, as we progress, uh, digital goods that are free available to all. We know Wikipedia, but imagine having a Wikipedia on an AI level for um, solving medical questions um, and then giving access to everybody to these kind of uh, tools. So um, I think 
that in that sense, I think I feel a, being a global citizen, but um, um, a global cit citizenship means as well um, having it connected to some sort of identity. And I think in a certain sense that um, the, the, the lots of the challenges that we have today is that we live in, in on platforms where there is like this global community, but even these global communities are not united. They are they are polarized, and 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 there are uh, groups that find each other with uh, that share sa uh, uh, same values. So, what actually happened into the uh, physical world is is happening on a global scale, uh, but in a very different way. So there is no un unity on a global digital level. Uh, there are there's a lot of polarization as we know so i don't think that it is uh, realistic to think that we can um, uh, destroy all borders that have to do with cultural differences and identity uh, but i do think that we need to work on um, uh, sustainability in in a sense that we stop competing on different elements uh, that um, are, are nonsense in that sense like and i think what what is happening through the digitalization is that we're going to go more and more into a localization because uh, one of the things we saw in, in COVID is that even in Germany that the ground substances to to produce medications were not available in Germany because they were all produced in China we didn't have masks like these global supply chains were completely failing where at the same time what we did is we created um, 3D printed open source designs that could be printed in a local maker hub uh, in a village. So I think we can um, start thinking about how do we globally connect, globally share, uh, but at the same time, again, uh, 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 build local products. Uh, same thing as in agriculture, but like on a, on a digital way, uh, because 3D printing and, and digital manufacturing is exponential so that means that the things that we can do with these technologies today are um, um, in five years going to be very different there's going to be way more complexity the price is going to drop and it's going to become cheaper as producing these goods here as importing them from china i i absolutely um I am aligned with you i don't think we have ever disagreed i'm not a big fan of ubi and i, I kind of have a different look, view and look at it but I also really, I mean, it's, it's just the proof of the collaboration during the pandemic and those services that you were able to deliver and the products you were able to deliver is not only a kudos, but it's a big way that how digital services, open source collaboration on a digital commons really is a much better operating system. And so I, I truly would like to see um, to kind of blend in what, what your, your answer was is the, the, uh, what you mentioned as well, this digital commons, something that is a global type of operating system or ways of functioning that is available and accessible to all and that we have more maybe digital diplomats or people who are, you know, we're seeing some of those emerge as well that it's not divided by nations or borders, but they're kind of um there to represent us that that we can have sources and tools open and available for all of us um i, I think that's a, a a real nice move in the right direction and i'm also big on emerging technologies are you talking more ai mixed with blockchain so digital ledger technology what type of things are are, are you hoping for can you give us more of a vision of of what that would look like well, yeah, I think blockchain for me is, uh, we looked into that, it's not a, a necessity in that sense, because um, at the end, it, it, uh, things can be solved through licensing. Like um, we all know the Creative Commons license for imaging. Uh, these are common goods, digital uh, commons. Um, um, so there's a lot what you can solve without technology because it's a, a legal topic. Um, um, and that's why we don't look too much um, in applying blockchain because blockchain goes down on creating data on the individual level. And we are not there that we can use uh, uh, healthcare data from let's say thousand individuals that we then merge together because data has context and every data set has been created in a different context. So if you would try to bring all these data sets together into one big data pool, you get a lot of messy data because each data comes from another social cultural context. It comes from another clinical context. Each each country has their own kind of healthcare system. So 
we are looking more into um, uh, creating uh, uh, digital collaboration platforms, creating agency, creating, uh, being vocal, using all these kind of social media uh, elements that give us a loud uh, uh, voice and create awareness and, and, and help people to understand that we, and that's kind of the change that we try to say is that we as humans, we produce data um, that is extracted out of our bodies um, and that we are fighting a world where people starting to use that data and extract the knowledge out of the data and privatize the data, uh, where I think that the value out of the data is belongs to society and not to the economy. It's a similar story like the uh, privatized water companies that buy land and they take the water molecules out of the soil, regardless if people in the surrounding are dying from hunger and they privatize water. Um, there are companies now that are tapping uh, on our bodies, extracting the data, and they are privatizing the life-saving knowledge and making it only available for a few others. So that's a nice analogy. So um, I started to play with to say like, we as society um, are um, 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 already a platform. Um, so we think in platforms. So we 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 don't use um, um, like we're not too technology focused. We are more in terms of um, changing the way how we look at things, changing the way how we look at value, changing the way how we license things um, 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 instead of uh, technology is an enabler for getting there, of course, but um, um, we don't start with technology and then go backwards to the problem. We look at what is the core and the core is how we look at data. Yeah. I, I couldn't have said it more succinct, and I appreciate that. Do you you've got some interesting things uh, that you're working on that are planning for for launch for next year and things? Um, uh, Victoria One Zero, can you tell us a little bit about that and your your original company Hippo AI and kind of how that has progressed not only during this time but what your overall mission and and, and uh, goal is where where you want to go and what you're providing. And maybe if you have some slides, you're welcome to show and uh, uh, tease us with that as well. Yeah, thank you for that. You, as you know, I've been, uh, I left I, my, my career at IBM, I think one and a half year ago, uh, because I wanted to focus um, um, on yeah, changing the direction of the current progress, which I don't think is progress at all, because what we are seeing that is that the world is, uh, as I said before, is looking at data as a tradable commodity. Um, and that means if you put data, you equal data to capital, that big capital will be able to buy the biggest data sets. And the bigger your data sets are, the more discoveries you will be able to get and, and you will be able to privatize. So that means that um, uh, eventually, uh, if we keep on looking at data as a commodity, that we will go into a kind of a centralization monopolization model. And you see that happening with Google buying Fitbit, and suddenly they have data of 80 million people that were uh, that Fitbit tracker. They don't open that data, that's part of their IP. Um, and so that's what I started to look at. How do you change that? And um, I was quite naive. You have to be very naive to start something like that uh, because you believe in a different future. Um, and it took me much more time to understand the problem and to understand how do you tackle that? Like, and I was first initially focused on technology, but then I learned that it's all about perception. Um, it is all about the mindset of people. Um, and as you know, people are not really good in understanding a problem that will happen in five to 10 years from now talking about climate change, um, um, we are really bad in predicting and behave, changing our behavior. And the problem that I try to tackle is not there yet. Like there is no monopolization of AI yet, but it will eventually go in that direction. And so what we started to do is to look at, okay, this needs to be a movement. This, need, this is not a, a, a technology solution. This needs to be driven by the people because it's about democratization of, the, of, of AI in medicine. Um, and I call this like um, uh, Lincoln uh, spoke on the Gatsbury address uh, during the civil war that a democracy have to be of the people, by the people and for the people. So um, in order that AI serves us as humanity, it needs to be of the people, by the people and for the people. And that means you need to create a people-driven uh, world. And 
Um, and that's why we started um, last year with, um, and it's it's like an MVP or minimal viable product, like a campaign. Um, and the campaign is called Victoria One Zero Written Down dot org. There's a website behind it. And Victoria is a person that I met uh, a year ago. She's a 32 year old breast cancer patient. And then we started, um, she wanted to change or use her disease to change her life and make something um, um, like this bad experience of having breast cancer as a 32 year old woman to turn that into something positive. Um, and um, she worked as well in, in marketing and she was already connected to AI because the AI was replacing a lot of the jobs in marketing. Uh, so she started to look in that and then uh, we are from one came the other. And then we said like, why don't you want to be the face and the name of our first campaign? Because then it's going to be 100% people driven. So Victoria um, uh, agreed on that and we created a, a campaign where Victoria is the spokesperson. Um, she tells a story um, and she calls everybody else uh, to do the same what she did. And, and she donated all the data to our um, Hippo AI Foundation and she asks all the other breast cancer patients and not breast cancer patients uh, to do the same. So we can start collecting data sets that we then um, after cleansing and working with academical institutes but then release under an open knowledge license that means everything what is extracted out of that data the even derived data um, is going to be a common good we know a mutual person who's also i guess working with you or i saw dr carolyn hearth is a uh, also on, on your Instagram site for Victoria One Zero. And, and I, I don't know if you wanna show us, if, if you'd like to show us a couple of slides and maybe describe them for my audio listeners. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And I, uh, uh, if you want, you, I don't want no pressure. So um, let me first go to the to the slides itself because there were a few aspects that are because it's it, it is a really complex topic and people don't understand like why Bart like AI uh, can't do much. Um, I don't know if you see my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So I think and that's where where, where like as a futurist and we both are in future IO in the faculty and we talk about futures um, um, a lot of the decisions that people take are quarterly driven and and I looked into the future of AI and medicine and what you start realizing if we get to the point of artificial general intelligence that probably we will create technology that is able to prevent and cure all diseases now we are far away from that, but as we are building larger, larger neural networks, we are going to be able to simulate more and understand more, and, and we will eventually get there. Um, I'm, at least that's my uh, personal view on this. And today we are already going from narrow AI to broader AI, um, but the foundation that we're going to build up that future on is that what we define today. And, and that's why I got active, because if you start working on a data monetization driven, data economy driven system, that future will be the same as today, where there was a lot of inequality in health, because suddenly the data is going to lead to privatization of knowledge. Uh, and privatization of knowledge already defines today, if you are born in Africa, you won't get access to that therapy because you can't afford it. And so life-saving knowledge is uh, walled. Like if you are born in Switzerland, you get access to the 2.2 million gene therapy for your children. Uh, but if you live in Romania, even, you don't get access to it. So I think now what we are building up that future of AI, we need to think about, okay, how do we break down inequalities then Let's do this differently this time and, and not go on the foundation of, of what we have been doing in the past. And um, so there was, there was a lot too much slides here, but what I started to do is as well, uh, is, is to look, we live in Europe and, and, and if you look at the, the conditions, the market conditions, and that's what is my biggest fear in that sense, um, we in Europe have the worst conditions to build medical AI because we, we don't have a healthcare system that is across Europe available. So like it's federated, like each country has their own healthcare system, their own rules, their own regulations. Each country has their own venture capitalists. It's all federated. Um, and then you even have lower investments. Uh, you don't have a European strategy. 
Um, I was sitting in a panel discussion uh, uh, two months ago, and then somebody called for, we need to create AI based from Europe. And then four sentences later, she told me, we need to create AI made in Germany. And I said, okay, is it Europe or is it Germany? Like there was this French competition versus Germany. We are federated, federations makes us weak in that sense. Uh, but we are human centered, which is good from an ethical perspective. We have very good quality on data. We are still good in the research, but our situation is really bad. So um, the future, as you know, what happening in China um, is that, uh, okay, they collect more data, they produce more data with their population, they have more investments. How do you tackle that? How do you avoid for getting colonized by AI services that come from a country or a region that has very different values and it's that that values that are started looking into uh, quite a lot because if if you start creating or using values that are not connected to our current values here then we will get a different healthcare system um, and that healthcare system will not be about um, that healthcare is inclusive it will be exclusive um, because it's going to be proof profit driven um, and and it's going to be based on monopolies instead of plurality it's going to be based on um, a world where science always were open where science is within the private premises of companies that is not open and we have to build trust to these organizations there's so much discussions on trust why do we suddenly need trust why don't they go just open? But no, they want to possess. Yeah. So they create this, this whole thing about trust. And so this is kind of the, the, the basics that I looked into. And I also looked into the um, things of, um, can we um, um, look at in the future what's going to happen with our fundamental rights in Europe? And, and there are quite some infringements that are coming. Like, um, I... I one of the infringements is that Article Two, the, uh, Article Three, is the right on integrity, physical and mentally. Um, that there are already AI services out there that can take all your data and they create a digital replica of yourself. The problem is you don't own that replica. <laughs> you can own the data, but you don't own the AI model that is the replica of yourself. Yeah. That means you could use my, Mark, you could use my voice and then I give you a, a specific uh, algorithm that I found on GitHub. You can, you only need five seconds of my voice and you can let me say whatever I want to, or I didn't want to say, but I, I would say it. You could even, there was somebody who called that algorithm to open uh, uh, X or to give access to a bank account uh, and using that synthetic voice and it worked. So we are getting synthesized, like in voice, in behavior, in um, 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 lifestyle, all these things. And then we need to talk about ownership. Um, and then <laughs> that's why I said, like a lot of the things that I'm confronted with is legal. Um, and then you talk about, okay, if somebody owns an AI model, not the data, but the AI model, and it behaves exactly like you and it looks in a vr world exactly like you uh, but you don't have ownership you will lose your right on integrity um, and you see that already happening in the porn industry where celebrities are being copied as the fakes on porn movies uh, celebrities have really good protection of their identity because they have super lawyers that can control it we don't so there's a lot of infringement, so, but I don't there, want to go. There, there was some, actually, there was some touches on this, on that new documentary, Social Dilemma, that was mainly yep. kind of uh, from the Center for Humane Technologies and uh, a lot on Facebook that what's going on there and some other platforms. So uh, it talks about that as well. I'd recommend my, my listeners go out and listen to that as well or watch that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love what you're telling us. So that's perfect. And so what we said, okay, what we wanted to do is, and, and the main question um, is, how do you want to create economical value when you open source? That, like I met politicians and they're all, um, yeah, they all are super scared that I'm going to destroy um, <laughs> the economical value. And it's like, just wait, if we don't act differently, we will be colonized by companies not coming from Europe anyway. So what value are you talking about? <laughs> like, like um, I think we need to, to act very differently and based on our fundamental rights. So, and then they asked me like, okay, how do you uh, create value? Because um, um, normally open source communities are being created 
after uh, the product is um, kind of commoditized. Um, like when the price drops to zero, then you see replicas in open source. But like the question here is, can we open source something that is not there yet and not commoditized? So can we create open source communities that then lead to the creation of commons? So these communities are all following a same similar purpose to build a different future together. And I think when we do that, um, we can create um, and, and make these um, AI tools available for companies that still, because you still need to build a medical product. We don't, we're not going to build end devices and we're not going to build um, um, uh, all these solutions. We are giving the, the intelligence uh, as a common good, but then people need to create an experience and engagement tools so they engage with patients or with doctors or with nurses. Yeah. And then what happens is we don't, if we make um, AI a common good, we will not have competition on life-saving information anymore. So, because the competition today in pharma is based on, I have the knowledge that saves your life and I own that IP and I put a price on it because I'm a monopolist on that knowledge. But if we create that as a common, we should really eradicate competition on life-saving information. Um, and then we can, uh, and I make this comparison to let people understand that. Imagine, Mark, that because you're a lot in the food and agriculture. Um, yes. thing, imagine that um, you would have, there's a lot on, a lot on lab-grown meat and, and 3D printed food that comes from plant-based or meat-based uh, cells. But imagine the price from that technology would be completely open, that technology would be completely open source and the price nearly drops to zero. You would probably solve a lot of the hunger problems, but you won't destroy the restaurant business. You will see more restaurants because suddenly people will pay for an experience. Um, it, it is like nobody wants to always eat in McDonald's to get just food. You, yeah. you, you go into a restaurant because you want to enjoy yourself. So, and that's what, what is really difficult for people to understand. If you destroy IP on life-saving knowledge, that you still will have a flourishing economy that people can um, uh, uh, build products on, but you will not have an economy that defines you're going to die because you were born in that country that can't afford it, uh, and you're going to live because you were born there. And I think it's something from old century thinking. We need to think differently. It's not a sustainable model. So that's the kind of economical thinking, and I think that's important to mention that we want to create what I call the digital commons that are commodities out of a data and AI models. And then we can create an economy that builds applications, user experiences, and that, that can be a, a competition. Uh, people can invest in these companies. I have nothing against people investing in companies in the country. I think I love the innovation that then happens, but let us stop driving innovation or competition based on something that saves your life. I, I think that's that's um, um, similar um, as telling we're gonna we're gonna privatize all recipes to bake food or to bake a bread and we make it only available to forty percent of the people how you bake a bread. <laughs> so in that sense, everybody can break a bread, and but some people do that more expensive as the others, and 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 I think we need to rethink um, that. So yeah, there's definitely so much rethinking in the healthcare industries that we need to do. And I, I think this is beautiful. I really appreciate you showing us the slides. Yeah, and, and so what, what came out as a result is that um I I there is this book that influenced me. It's from Gustave Le Bon, he's a French psychologist, a 200 years old book. And it's about the psychology of the masses. Um, how do you create mass movements? What actually um, Gustave Le Bon describes in that book is that mass movements in history always were connected to images, uh, visualizations, not words, not text. It's an image. It's a strong image. Everybody thinks about the French Revolution, about that image of that woman standing on top with the flag. It's an image we know. When you think at 9-11, we change the whole world. You think of these images. You don't think about history of these people or whatever. You think, you think in images. People think in images. So if you want to create a mass movement, you need to visualize. And how do you create visualize that the data 
of us belongs to uh, you and, and we humanity are the platform and we can decide who uses our data, not them deciding how to, we can use the services derived of our data. No, no, we turn that opposite way around. So we created this um, uh, campaign now, um, uh, which um, that's, I'm gonna share now again. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So what we did is um, start working with our campaign, which was Unite Data Defeat Cancer. Now we, what we learned is, uh, well, we need to change this because it's a Unite Data Defeat Inequalities. But we started with cancer because we could tap into the cancer movements. We learned a lot about all the other cancer movements. Um, and then we had like, for example, Victoria, um, I hope you can see Victoria now, is it? Yeah, right. we can, yeah. Yep. So Victoria uh, telling about her disease and, and how AI is gonna change it. So really she's the person that is speaking and uh, that's Victoria using the ESCA filter. So we started to work with visualizations. Um, and this is the ESCA code where we say like, okay, this is about your data. This is um, uh, um, about cancer awareness, but as well, using that data uh, to uh, uh, analyze and train it for AI services. So we created a lot of these arty, techy uh, um, uh, designs. And people ask me like, what, what is that what you're doing? And I said, like, well, I'm applying Gustave Le Bon's movement. It didn't work that well because uh, we don't have a movement yet, but we didn't want to engage that much um, uh, yet because uh, this was a test campaign. We're gonna launch a, a, a super large campaign in April next year uh, with like 30 times the budget of what we have now. I learned that you need to buy influencers to first yeah. get out there, yeah. uh, which I didn't want to do because I'm an idealist, but then I learned, well, we need to do that uh, so we can uh, accelerate growth. Um, so we're gonna work a lot with um, the visual stuff. And I'm also um, in connection with an art collective in Austria. Uh, these were the ones that build these firework drones in, in uh, the, during the Olympics. It's uh, Ars, Ars Electronica, they're quite famous. And we are now thinking about how can we create art that represents that we as society own our data and how can you make people attach uh, emotionally to a very mathematical, um, uh, dry economical topic. That is perfect. I absolutely love how, how, how you're combining those things. And um, I have a lot of listeners on my show that are not only artists and authors, but I think that they, you'll have some people reach out to you and definitely see how they can help and join your movement to create the movement that you want to have. I, I want to get into some more uh, uh, questions. You know, um, there, there is uh, this general belief in our world of neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, and uh, you know, only survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, natural selection. You know, I wanted to get your thoughts and feelings on how aligned you are with this severe competition. Uh, obviously, from what I hear and what you've told us so far, open source creative commons, it goes totally <laughs> against that that type of thinking. And I, I'm wondering if, if uh, you've also, with many other greats, uh, have come to the realization that there are some better ways to get us a lot further in the future with uh, different types of thinking and, and the way we use our data. Yeah, I, I, thank you for bringing that up, Mark. Um, um, I definitely don't believe that the markets are self-regulated. I think the best example in healthcare is the US where uh, the healthcare costs are 18.6% of the GDP, but 40 million people don't have access where the price of uh, insulin, something that was invented in 1922, in the last 10 years went up in the US by 800% the price, which is completely ridiculous because it was invented in 1922. <laughs> um, the market won't regulate it because the market defines if you have something that saves somebody's life, it's like that somebody hangs on a cliff uh, with one hand and then a pharmaceutical company or another one comes to you and says, like, I will save you, but please give me all your money. And, and people will give all their money. Like I think uh, I read this number recently that over 50% of the personal bankruptcies in the US are related to healthcare cost. Uh, people get bankrupt. People have to sell their house. Uh, uh, you do co-payments and, and uh, even during COVID, 
a lot of people in the US who were bad insured or not insured did went to the hospital because there was, uh, if, you, if you are two weeks in intensive care unit uh, in a hospital, you have a half a million dollars in costs, um, you are bankrupt for your whole life. Um, um, so Can I, I don't... give you an example of that real quick? Yeah. So I'm, I'm originally from America, but I live in Hamburg, Germany. Um, I, I was born, a lot of people don't know this, I was born with a genetic heart defect, um, okay. genetic, and I needed to get a surgery, but I, it wasn't discovered until uh, uh, I, I was in almost in my 40s. It wasn't discovered until I was <clears throat> almost in my 40s, and when it was discovered, it was an immediate threat needed to be uh, operated on. And um, I ha had a very expensive, very rare uh, operation. Uh, it was called alcohol septal ablation. And um, uh, I, before I went in for that, that operation, I got pre-approval for my American health insurance company, right? They approved it. I went and had the surgery, came out. I'm still alive, do, you know, re recovered great. But then my after I had it, my insurance company denied it and said it was pre-existing because it was genetic heart, heart uh, you know, heart defect genetically received and I had a pre-existing condition. That bill was over $780,000. Um, I, I, I can not tell you the pain, the heartache, the after just recovering from a heart surgery to see that bill come and um, I about passed out. And then I was in, I, I kid you not, uh, almost eight months worth of battles with, uh, with lawyers and, and these insurance companies to get them to accept the claim that, that I had a pre, uh, uh, that I had a letter of approval beforehand to get them to pay for that. Now, now I'm on the German healthcare system. By no means is it perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better um, uh, system than what is in the U.S. And uh, so I totally know what you mean, and, and to be in that position is the most horrific thing uh, uh, to go through. And so I, I, I really know what you're talking about. You're not just speaking from, you know, uh, giving us data and facts. There's people and lives and uh, a common good here that we need to serve and give that to every human being on, on Earth. Uh, in a much better system. So I, I just wanted to share it because it really tied into what you're you're talking about, some of this data from the U.S. Yeah, I'm sorry you had to go through this. And, and, and unfortunately, I heard quite a lot of these stories working 20 years in that industry. Um, um, it, it, it is what it is. Like people, um, um, in, if it's poorly market-driven, will um, rationalize on how much is somebody willing to pay. Like um, there was a... Um, Something that upset me, I, I, had, a, I had one of the, 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 the most controversial discussions this summer uh, on a conference um, in Austria in uh, August with the CEO of Roche. And it's like, there was a one-to-one -one kind of battle discussion, closed versus open. So it's already that far that I came, that I'm allowed to have these kind of discussions, which is good because I think these uh, companies have a very old mindset. and. Um, I, I said to him that um, at the beginning he got really defensive in the argument and uh, was like pushing me in the corner of a communist and everything else. And no, no, no. So I, I, I don't, I don't believe in communism because it never worked in any of the countries. Uh, but I, um, um, and I said like perhaps there are different ways of forms of capitalism in a sense. Like in Germany we talk about soziale Marktwirtschaft. And which is nothing has to do with neoliberal uh, capitalism. There are very different forms um, of this. And, and I said to him, well, I'm a conscious capitalist as a provocation. And, um, <laughs> and, and because he was putting me in the corner, I said, but you forget, like we are, I, I, I'm also a believer of the economy and everything else, but I think I'm a conscious capitalist. And so I put him into the extreme corner of being a neoliberal, neoliberalist. And um, at the same time, we had discussions as well about about open sourcing drug development because th that's I just mentioned before that the price of diabetes went up 800 percent in the U.S. as something that was developed in 1922. But we are today living in a world where we are going through the technology in an era where we're going to have 
a lot of solutions for gene uh, uh, related uh, diseases like your, you you had yourself and there is an example now there is a, a a gene therapy for a rare childhood disease uh, a musculoskeletal disease uh, where normally these kids when they grow up they get um, uh, completely paralyzed and need to be uh, 40 60 years in a wheelchair and 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 that generates a lot of cost for the system they don't pay taxes so the pharmaceutical view is um well normally that person would have paid taxes he, um, and so he would create income for the government for society so they kind of added to the calculation of the price of the medication and then they um, say like and it would have cost in terms of care special cars transportation it would have cost him his whole life that kind so they come up with a price of that medication for 2.2 million us dollars for treating a real childhood disease where in fact uh, most of the funding and the initiators of that therapy were parents who started an ngo <laughs> and and then the biotech that was created uh, after the parents kind of initiated that whole treatment uh, the biotech was financed of course by investors uh, because i don't think it's the the pharmaceutical company itself that is evil it's the system uh, the finance system behind it because they these investors uh, pushed money into that to get to phase three clinical trial um, uh, and then they saw this drug is really going to work and then that company where they invested uh, in total, um, uh, it was um, 350 million on investments. They did an exit of 8.8 .8 billion for a rare disease. <laughs> and But they knew they could do that because they calculated that they could sell it for 2.2. No, the only problem is that only 20% for the world get access to that. And even in Belgium, where I come from, mothers started to doing crowdfunding campaigns to get access to that treatment because our Belgium health insurance can't afford 2.2 million. And, and I said, like, this is completely nuts. And this is the first gene therapy. And we have so many, so many diseases to solve. But as we're going more and more precise, you can't sell that a million times a year. You have 1,000 clients a year. So they think we need to uplift that price. And I think that is, that is nearly criminal. Like, that is, has nothing to do with neoliberalism, in a sense, because you are you're monopolizing on something that yeah, was yeah. Um, initiated by parents it, who it's suffered. really criminal yeah well yeah. i was just in, a, in an event in denmark it's called law futura and they had uh, a gentleman from uh, um, the future of pharmaceuticals where they were using 3d printing technologies where they would open source or deliver the recipes to different types of pharmacies that printed on demand pharmaceuticals through 3D printing technology. They download the recipes, have the certain chemicals, and then just print it there on demand. So uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping we're thinking more open source and how do we drive the price down? How do we make it more affordable and accessible to everyone around the world instead of you know, this, this polarization and distancing of, of humanity and, and uh, the basic needs and services just to, to remain alive. And, and that's also in the, when we talked about earlier about this universal basic income, I, I absolutely am not a proponent of that. And that's actually failed back in Nixon's times, but there's gotta be a different way that um, humanity as, as a global humanity has this thought process that the basic needs, just by being born and living uh, as a human being, that your basic needs are covered and met, and that we're all on the same playing field, that the global operating system is one that works for us all. Because as we see today, uh, all over the world, we're seeing civil uh, unrest or dis-ease where our current civilization frameworks are no longer working for us. You know, there's the Bolsonaro's, the Putin's, the Shays, the Trumpocalypses, the Duarte's, the Erdogan's, and these crazy systems that are going on that are just seem to be failing us. And we need to get up to speed with our exponentially growing world and come up uh, to apply some of these wonderful ideas and technologies and and you know, open source that you're discussing. I think that's a step in the right direction to get us there. 
I'm, I'm going to challenge you a bit on what, what you said, because everybody is now celebrating Biden. It's a good thing that Trump got the elected. But I don't celebrate Biden because, in a sense, um, um, it is still the old system um, and the electoral system in the US is corrupted. Like what we call in Europe corruption is called campaign funding in the US. Um, and the reason why Obamacare didn't touch on the price, like if you look at the price of insulin and everything, nothing happened with Obamacare. The, the, the prices in the industry, they are always flourishing and the profits are there, the pharma. Um, but uh, what happened is that, okay, you have to mandatory insurance and then there was more contribution. So people are included in that insurance. But as these politicians take money from the industry from before they even can say one word, um, um, that system is already corrupted. And I think looking at, uh, there is this website called opensecrets.org where you can look and drill down into the, the GOPS and the foundation and who is funding. And um, I have a big fear that even now with Biden, uh, he will not be able to act, not because the Republicans in the Congress, but because the money is already tied to an agenda. Um, and and it's like the weapon industry and uh, like that is uh, that has a oh, huge influence, and that's why we can't solve the issue of uh, um, our weapons being sold to um, at people. And I think that is what I challenge to you because you have quite a lot of hope in that. I I don't like I I, I don't have hope as still when capital can corrupt and influence political decisions. I, I actually, I'm not sure I have hope in, in, in the Bidens. I think it's a, a definitely a better choice than, than uh, uh, yeah. a Trumpocalypse. But what, what, uh, here, here's the true uh, uh, proof in the pudding, so to say. Uh, if, if in his first year, he, he, he not, not only uh, for the United States uh, fixes all the, the issues around uh, the COVID and things, but first and foremost, they, they, they should have, the uh, entire world, but the United States should have learned that the electoral college, the process of voting and politics in the United States is so, something from broken, that it needs to be fixed, that there, whether it's digitized or made in a trustless system, that uh, there is no accounts, there is no uh, issues like this. It's like we're in the dark ages again, uh, reliving what happened in 2000 with uh, uh, Al Gore and the dimple Chad. I mean, my God, how hard is it to figure out, you know, who, who won an election and that there's so much, as you're uh, saying, corruption and issues in that. They need to fix that. They need to get a new system or they need to fix the one that they have so that uh, at least we can't see all the damn corruption right up front and the polarization of the world. Uh, one thing that came out of that, that that I was astounded with is that 21 million United uh, States Americans uh, who are of voting age don't even have an identification card. They can't vote because they don't have an ID to vote. I mean, Jesus, in the United States, they don't have an ID to vote because it's too expensive because there's other things in place. That is just one of numerous things around the whole process that are just uh, unfathomable, oh. wrong, and, and corrupt. And, and that, you know, wow, the greatest voter turnout in, in history. Uh, everybody should be voting. Everybody of voter age who, who uh, should be voting because otherwise um, you're just saying you don't believe in that system, then let's get rid of that damn system. And uh, so, I mean, I, I think you and I are more aligned on, on, on uh, different thinkings. Um, I, I might be uh, very polar when I come out with the, the true uh, feelings and beliefs of, on what I think are some global operating systems that would work for us all in the world. And, and some of those ideas that I have are actually a little bit, and I don't want to get too off topic, but just to touch mm -hmm. on it, it are based on... Um, kind of a sustainability uh, um, a model or a one that we use around sustainability and that's the earth overshoot day. It's based off of a global hectare that is replicable. Um, and that's how we calculate the day, uh, earth overshoot day, how we've gone beyond our finite resources. Mm -hmm. It's based off of a replicable global hectare. And I believe that every human being should be entitled to that global hectare and that stewardship themselves, so long as they're living 
And uh, through that stewardship, that's a hell of a lot better than a universal basic income because it guarantees you enough food, water, security, shelter, uh, resources to live a ripe old age if you have good stewardship over it. Whereas today, that 1.6 global hectares that we have that uh, are calculated that earth overshoot day, we're using per person something like 2.98 global hectares per person. That's why it's an earth overshoot or a deficit. And so I have this idea that uh, if we did a twist on UBI and used a global hectare and gave everybody that as an inalienable right, that 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 could possibly change some things. And that it, it's there's a lot more to it than that, but that's more my thinking. Yeah, and, and I think you are uh, touching the commons again. Um, um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, which is one of the scholars bit, yeah. Yeah, that I started reading. She's a Nobel Prize laureate, and she talked about the tragedy of the commons because it was um, how do you divide land and the usability of land to uh, with different people. And, and with, 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 with land, it was difficult because it was um, um, there was always like, powerful people that were overusing it and, and people are just stupid but like that's why i applied it on data there is always more and more data so you don't have that problem of overuse in that sense uh and that's why digital commons probably going to work and and the commons was difficult but what you're explaining is actually the whole idea of commons like how do you um, create common goods and land and water and air uh, these are all common goods like how do you go into that direction that you really um, define common goods and 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 if we start now creating digital um, uh, replicas of our physical world um, then um, we, we in, in the areas where it's highly regulated and protected by politicians industry lobby and whatever um, then we need to see like that in healthcare we definitely need a, a common strategy um, I agree. <laughs> Um, it's 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 like in education, healthcare, education, uh, um, uh, food, water. Uh, these are the basics. Um, and and like Gucci now um, released a ten thousand dollar dress as an Instagram filter. I have nothing against that. That people spend their money for something idiotic as a filter that everybody looks like. Hey, I can spend ten thousand. Let them spend it. Let them flow. Let the money flow. And instead of people sitting on it. Um, um, but it's, it is not hurting anybody. But if you're going to start creating uh, and using your money to create intellectual property on something that saves anybody somebody's life and you don't allow people to have access, that's where you put a border and say, like, you don't and I do. And, and I think in healthcare, that, that, that is absolutely wrong. Yeah, I totally agree. And my hardest question for you today is going to be next, and that is the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word that we're all thinking about this year. It's actually, what's the future, Bart? Well, um, 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 the, well there are different futures out there. Uh, so I can only kind of, um, and I believe in, in, in a pluralistic worldview. So um, I think it's really dangerous to have a, um, a forcing every, everybody together in, into going into one direction. Um, but I think, um, and that's not the idealistic future, but I think what we will see is that there will be more and more um, um, communities, global communities or physical communities that are following specific ideologies. And some people will be completely disconnected <laughs> uh, from technology. Others will be completely connected. Brain computer interfaces are getting real. Um, what happens if somebody is attached to a brain computer interface and, and he is more powerful in his thinking as the other because he's like, uh, as the ability to access, or he has a bionic eye and he can watch much further. I, I think that will drive a competition between these humans, um, most probably in China first, uh, where people are going to uh, even augment themselves or they're going to mutate themselves, uh, use technology to um, get better as a human. You have now in Silicon Valley this whole hype on longevity, where um, people are spending billions on investments on uh, to 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 not die and be, and 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 they are targeting the billionaires. So I said like, okay, this is funny. Like we have now 
uh, over 2000 years try to dissolve inequalities. <laughs> and now we're going to give the billionaires the possibility to live 300 years. I <laughs> think this is completely ridiculous. <laughs> so I think there will be, unfortunately, more and more of these uh, groups that are driving specific targets. But at the same time, I think, and that's, I found a sentence, I'm, I was lecturing on a Chinese group at a business school, and then somebody uh, of my students told me, you know, he said like, we humans, because I was surprised how similar we were thinking, and you always think Chinese are very different. Um, and they said like, we, you and I are more connected than each of us to our own government. And I said, like, I didn't even expect that to hear from you from China, because that's not how our stereotyped world uh, look like. And, and I think the, the, the big hope that I have is that we build more global movements that um, uh, have more purpose, that are connected to the United Nations sustainability goals, that will get more traction. Um, and, and and that these other groups that I talked about will be niche groups. Um, uh, but I don't believe that we will get rid of them. But, uh, and and I, I, I don't have a problem with it uh, uh, because it's um, otherwise you becoming totalitarian and tell you have to live in following my views. And that, that's, I'm not a totalitarian person at all, but I, I respect people's opinion, even if I completely disagree with it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we will see more collaboration um, on shared values, shared beliefs. Um, and if these beliefs are about creating a more sustainable planet, and you see that with the younger generations that are much more purpose-driven, I have hope that we can um, um, switch it into another direction. Yeah, I, what I hear out of that is just a little bit more of this balance than this polarization until uh, this unbalances. It seems like they're uh, there will always be the, the you know the the good and the bad. It just if if we can keep it within a, a workable balance for us all, um, would would be nice. Yeah, are, are you familiar with Plato's cage? Uh, no, I'm not. So Plato, as a philosopher, he there was a story about uh, prisoners being in a cage and they were chained and they could only see to a wall and behind them was a fire. And then in front of the fire, there were people walking. So the only thing that these prisoners saw their whole life were shadows on that, projected on that cage. And then one was able to escape. And then he came out of the cage and he saw real people instead of shades. And he believed that the shades were real. The real people were like shades because he was grow up in that cage. And, and I think that's kind of what he wants to tell that with that philosophy is that everybody has their own view on reality and 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 that's what what is the problem that we are this global unified thing but we all have a different view on reality and 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 that's based on beliefs culture and all these things and um, and and I, I believe in multicultural uh, societies and I think that is beautiful that's what makes humanity but we should get, get more acceptance of different views and i think the, the the there is no monopoly on on moral um which i found a bit difficult because people are judging more people based on morals but that's quite difficult like what is what is what is the best moral compared to the others that what religion did before and 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 we know how that turned out um in a sense um, um they were like preaching uh, things and then we had the spanish inquisition and they were like you don't follow our moral standards you get you you like chopped off yeah. like that doesn't work like we need to accept people as they are and and um and i think that that um I'm like me, with me, I'm not fighting against big pharma and big corporates. I just want to create a new ecosystem. And and if I find followers, then we will create a new ecosystem. And 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 if people believe in a certain thing, then they will follow. Uh, what I really hear out of that as well is uh, not not only the the pure goodness uh, of, of what your message and what you want to achieve is, but the biodiversity. I hear a lot of not just diversity, but it's a biodiversity. It's we're all on the same spaceship Earth. And, and, and this during this COVID time, honestly, we've dealt with some biome issues of our, our planet suffering and the biome of our planet suffering. But then we're also dealing with a lot of biome issues in our body that uh, 
our gut health, our immunity is not where it is or where it should be, uh, um, as strong as it should be. And that uh, those two are kind of um, need to be very diverse, but also they operate in harmony with each other and that they need to kind of work together. Um, that, you know, the reason I asked in the beginning was about the global citizen and your thoughts and beliefs on that is because really the only thing that's been divided by uh, uh, borders and nations and, and that is as human beings because species are COVID, uh, um, our, our biome, earth, air, water, and things, that's all uh, boundless without nations and borders and it's traveling and spreading around the world. And, and so we need to get into a world that's a little bit more in line with this uh, homo symbiosis, symbiotic earth, you know, this uh, very diverse uh, biome of ours. I have just uh, two more questions for you. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, if, if there's anything you, you left out that you would like to address or speak on, I'd, I'd love to hear that. But they're more selfish takeaways for my listeners. I want them to um, kind of be left with, with, with a nice takeaway of something that they could apply or that maybe had the power to to, to change their life or to help them and what they're thinking about to, to research or read or, or to apply. If there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be basically your message? Well, one, I find it always difficult to have one single message. Um, you can, but, if you have more, you can give them what will we'll love it. There, are, there are, I, of course, this last one and a half years since I left my career, um, I, I went through a lot of learnings and, and these are lessons um, in that sense. Um, and I changed my views on a lot of topics. I did a lot of research and um, I, I, I went into specific uh, scholars and, and their research. Um, and what I, mostly when I started, like that all I did, I'm, I'm going to open source medical AI. I didn't even know how. Um, but I had that vision and I said like, I just don't accept that. We are just gonna go blindly towards that future that is going to be about hyper inequality where we are gonna import um, um, uh, US based value systems on if it comes to healthcare, uh, which is gonna lead to my son being surveilled by AI services that serve the economy and don't serve society. And I said like, no. Um, so I think that, that that belief in that building that vision um, and then what my biggest challenge was is that even my closest uh, friends they were like oh did you incorporate already i don't find a website and like everybody starts doubting even the best friends even the guys who tell that they want a better planet they all start doubting um, and they all kind of are critical like like i think 99 percent of my environment got critical about I'm going to do something good. <laughs> I said, why don't you get as critical to the others? Like, why are you getting critical about me? And why don't you help me? So nobody's going to help you at the beginning. Um, and you need to be damned um, um, kind of focused, hyper-focused. And you need a lot of um, uh, patience. And you need probably 10 times as much time as you originally planned. Uh, but if you want to really change them, pick one single thing focus and don't stop and if you do that i think things will will change and um, i'm now getting out i'm um, i'm incorporating I'm, I'm building up a team next year um, um there was a lot of things happening in the plan but it took much more longer um as expected um, and i was really surprised that quite a lot of people in my environment which i thought would be kind of excited they were all apart um but I can't find a website and everything else. Say, why don't you ask me a question how you can help? Why do you want to go on a website and read what I'm doing? Why don't we talk and have a conversation? So you feel completely alone at the beginning. Yeah, uh, and totally you need uh, 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 the best uh, lesson to everybody who is like, um, 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 it, it can be a female or male, but like you need a damn good wife in my case, um, a partner that believes in you and you need a stable environment uh, to, to, to be able to do that. Um, and I'm damn lucky to have that. You are very lucky and I'm glad that you're persistent and dedicated and, and sticking with that fight because I see the payoff and I, I, I've, I've, I've followed you and you're wise beyond your years when you 
years ago when we first met, but I've also seen that you're, you're persistent and you're, you're evolving to something very beautiful that's coming out uh, for all of us. So um, we can only all benefit from, from your success. So the last question I have is um, <clears throat> more so, I think I already know the answer from what we've discussed today, but what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you said, damn, I wish I would have known that from the start or, or is it more about the journey? Well, it's definitely more about the journey. Otherwise, I would have known that I would wish for that. It would have known because you only know things that you experience. <laughs> um, and um, I, I spent 19 years in, in uh, corporate um, afterwards. Now, people say, like, how did you survive? It's like, well, um, I was a, a wild duck at IBM. I was always a bit like not the corporate person, but um, be open to learning. Um, and I think that's um that that was my uh, big thing is like um you need to you, you don't get um, uh, there instantly like that's what i kind of have a bit of issues with the purpose generation they instantly want to become a board member with, with 22. Uh, and i was like well <laughs> that's a bit difficult <laughs> yeah but we don't have young people on the board to think about the future so like well yeah sometimes you have to be really start focusing on working and getting experience and i think um um, experience is 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 is, is important uh, because experience is that what allows you to grow and have a, a beautiful metaphor to to share with with your audience. Um, um, when I grew up, I was uh, fascinated by snow and um, like um, when you uh, uh, take a ball into snow and you roll a ball, then if you start rolling it in only one direction, the ball becomes a wheel, but in the, in the middle you will find the ball, but it, it will grow really fast, uh, uh, high, because it only rolls in one direction and it will become very good in rolling in one direction. But then when it, this com it, you use an analogy with your life um, and you roll always in one direction and you um, have changed or you took the wrong values, which you mostly do when you are young, um, then that wheel will fall and then you will need years to find that ball again to roll in all directions. And what I try to do is, I, I always was curious and that ball always rolled in all directions. And if you do that, you don't grow that fast, but you grow stable and you, you have a ball that can't fall. So whatever happens with you, you are still able to roll. Um, and, and, and that's some life philosophy that I uh, created for me 20 years or 25 years ago because I'm a, a huge addict on snow and mountain sports. I lived in Switzerland for a while. But I think that is something that people forget because they all want to go and be a wheel and be fast and go and hyper-focused. But then you're going to fall. <laughs> and the, the higher that wheel is, the bigger your fall will be if you have never fallen before. I love it. That is that is the perfect wisdom for all my listeners. And uh, if unless you have something else you'd like to share or tell us, I think we're done. Yeah, but well, to the audience, if I can use the time, like um, uh, uh, follow us on uh, if you're on social media on hippo underscore AI uh, on Instagram or um, uh, victoria 10org um, I need all the support I can get to get there. I'm. I'm a Gemeinnütziger GmbH, which means I'm a non-profit um, I, in Germany that is really well controlled. Um, I can't sell data. I've designed everything that the system is not hackable, so I can't, uh, in case of emergency, sell the data. Um, everything is like really well done. So I, I would love to get support, people sharing the story. Um, yeah, um, I think... Um, um, I'm on a big mission and I really would love uh, to get all your support and I would be very thankful for that. Thank you so much, Bart. You've got my support and I know a lot of my listeners as well. So uh, we'll, we'll hear more from you and I'll put all your links and, and things in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time, Bart. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day and kiss that beautiful baby and wife for me. I will. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>